Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome, welcome to meeting six of Move the Bytes Working Group, uh, where we talk about moving bytes, we figure out how to move those bytes, we measure the bytes that we're moving, and so on and so forth. Uh, today, we are on our sixth meeting. We have a pretty light agenda. Housekeeping is very easy. Uh, we've settled into a really nice cadence of folks using time to present uh, exciting upcoming protocols. I think we're, we have a continuing discussion ready in our uh, Slack channel within the Falkland Slack. And uh, today we have Jeropo coming up, who's going to be talking about a new protocol. Uh, or I, I subbed in 20 minutes. Jeropo, you, you pick the amount of time to talk. And then from there, it's just open discussion. And so this is really easy. Ideally, we'll get some fun and exciting ideas, and we'll have a chance to sort of challenge us as we go. But with that, Jeropo, you ready to take it away? Cool. Make sure you can share a screen. We'll give you a second set up. Um, so, uh, hi, I'm going to talk about Rapid, which is a thing I've talked, I've described the ID in the IKFS game 2022, and so this is, a, I've made the first implementation now, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, again, for, for those who don't know what the goal is, I maintain Kubo, and we have a small issue that our download speed are not very fast. Um, right now, we use Gobi to app to exchange blocks, and uh, our client is very slow. So I'm mainly interested in doing a new client. It's not a new protocol, unlike uh, the other things we've seen in this working group. So uh, yeah, sorry, it's not a new protocol. It's, it will be ratio compatible. You will be able to download from existing node. And one of the things that uh, is like first the speed, Secondly, the efficiency, because our current uh, client uses lots of network and uh, CPU to download very slow. So we want to have higher efficiency. And the last one is be able to use more than one protocol, uh, because we're probably going to find out that we don't have one awesome protocol that solves all use cases. Uh, so if we can use multiple protocols at once, that would be cool. Uh, I'll start with the demo right away. Uh, I have a a small rapid client, it's going to download this.ipfs.io, which is a 50 gigabyte, a uh, gigabyte, sorry, from three gateway at once, which is no four, sorry. And uh, each gateway has three concurrent runner. I'm going to speak why we have multiple one, but we can see the speed is pretty good. It varies a bit because uh, the gateways themselves, uh, most of them use Kubo, and Kubo is very uh, underwhelming. And like sometimes it sends you blocks fast, sometimes no. Uh, I don't really know why, but we can see that it has a, a very decent speed. If we compare that to the GoBit swap from earlier, um, that was uh, that is far faster. And I had an example. Right? This is like a maximum I can reach with my fiber, which is great to know that I, I have a protocol that sometimes is like limited by my very fast internet and not by uh, by the protocol itself. So if we just go back to the presentation. Yeah, compared to the three megabyte you get for a good bit swap, I would say it works pretty well. Uh, so how it works, the, this is the thing we're going to look at. This is the main internal representation of Rapid. Uh, that's a tree, which approximates a graph. Uh, is there a tiny, tiny difference? This is mainly a graph, uh, a DAC, sorry. And so we are going to see, we're going to assume that this is a Merkle DAC. And each node right here, is a block if we want to download in the Merkle DAC. And it's going to work with a divide and conquer strategy. So at first, we, we have a three different connection. Let's say it's three different gateways. And all of those gateways are going to start downloading the only block we know. So for the color coding, purple is a downloader. Red is a block we know about, but we have not downloaded yet. So we just know the CID of that block. And red, uh, black is a block we don't know about. Um, so everyone start downloading the same block. Now let's say X get lucky. X uh, got the first block. So the protocol I'm using right now is car file over HTTP. So I mean, I send one CID as a request and that gives me uh, a stream of blocks that is all the blocks under that CID. So uh, the dotted line is that X is still downloading the root. However, because of the way the protocol works, it's gonna be, also giving me all of the blocks underneath root. 
And so those protocols are called server driven because it's the remote server that is driving the, the download. It's the remote server that is sending me more and more blocks. So now we have a small issue that Z and Y continue to download root, even though we already have it. So uh, at this point, I just kill the connection. Um, somewhat, so there has a tiny efficiency issue. Uh, it's not very efficient. We can all talk more later about the implication of doing that, but I'll just close the connection and like see whatever. Um, so what happened now is that uh, we have some numbers, which will get important very shortly. Uh, right now, so Z, I killed the connection of Z. And Z was downloading a root. So it's going to look within the child of roots which one it wants to download. Uh, for now, uh, at, at this stage, this is the view of Z. Uh, Z sees that they are all the same one, uh, metric. And so he just pick one random. Uh, now we have something interesting that's going to happen is that it's X time to, to choose why it's going to download. Uh, oh, no, actually. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, whatever, order. Um, so, okay, so we are in this situation. We kill the connection of Y, but Y is very slow, so it's not responding yet. So now what we have is X, and X just got uh, I. So in this stage, we have I. It got explored, so it's on blue, now we know about it. And we also know about those blocks more. There's a block on the Y. And again, the dotted lines, because of the way the protocol works, server driven. So I expect the server to send me the blocks. So they have uh, dotted arrows through X have dotted arrows or uh, the leaf blocks. And Y still has a metric of one, even though we still downloaded it. Uh, no. Okay, Z got more blocks. So Z got its block. And now we have something interesting is that X still thinks it, it wants to download E, even though we already have E. That's because the protocol doesn't let me say, I don't want to download that block. So uh, later, again, will be useful. OK, so now we have Y that wants to download something. Y is very slow. Um, y is going to look, so Y was at root. So it's going to look at root. And at root, is going to look within all the children. And it's going to see what children are available. And it has a preference is that it will choose a children with a metric that's slow. So the point of the metric, uh, which is a number next to it, is a form of like the higher it is, the less that's a block we want, a part of the that we want to explore. Um, so when Y looks at this, it doesn't want to look at, at E because there is already, already two people competing for E. So it's it's like between competing with only X and competing between X and Z, it's more interesting to compete with only X because it like the likelihood to have duplicated blocks is lower. So Y picks A. Um, Small optimization. If you see, it's likely that uh, if you see two blocks, one that are downloaded and some that are not, even though the metric of y, of i is higher, I mean, sorry, even though at this stage they have the same metric because i is already downloaded, uh, you, you would prefer to start your download from the top of the road, uh, uh, closer to the high of the graph. So here a is the best one because uh, it's not downloaded and it has the lowest metric of all of them. So why start downloading A? Oh, and sorry. So why start downloading A? And now we have X. Again, the, it has a dotted line to E, which we already have. And it just downloaded E. So we are either about to download E or we got E. Um, that's a bad thing. So because uh, we don't actually know the order from the protocol of, uh, sorry, the get to protocol doesn't tell us the order of the blocks. We don't know in which way we are going to, with what order we are going to get it. So now X just sees that it downloaded the block and it's, oh, we already have it. So it's going to kill the connection because now we, we don't know what's happening. We, we, we just know that we were downloading a bunch of blocks and some of them got downloaded and we want to avoid downloading duplicated data. So what X does is that it killed all of the dotted line, all of the connection, and it, 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 it stopped downloading block at this point. And it's looking at the root because this was a previous head. And it's going to run the same algorithm of I'm going to go, go down the graph, look up the metric, and pick the best block looking to me. So it's look at the root. And at this point, the best block is uh, I, because I have a zero metric. So it starts downloading I. However, we already have I, so it's not going to download it. It traversed it. So that means that it's interested in that part of the DAG, but we have not sent a network request yet. Um, the second part, after looking at I, is repeat the same thing. We still, we look up the metric of all the children and we pick one. In this case, they all have same metric. So all no downloaded. So we just pick one randomly. And um, uh, so yeah, 
graphs like to change the layout of the graph. So it moved in the center now. And so it's downloading J. Uh, an important thing to note is that even though it's downloading J, I still have a metric of one. Uh, you can think of the metric as the number of people downloading the blocks or those child blocks. The point of this is that if we have a new downloader arriving on the top, if it look at the metric, uh, if I were zero, for example, because no one downloading I, well, it might go there, even though we already have X. So because we already have people on all places of the DAG here, they are all of mostly the same interest. Um, the goal of this is that when you have a lot and lot of downloader, you don't have uh, clusters of downloader where, like if you have a, a part the part of the DAG that is very deep, we don't want to, to go keep, the, keep going deeper with tens and tens of people. We want to reparty, uh, we want to partition people somewhat balanced on the DAG. Uh, so X is very fast, it's just downloaded J. And so we can, we see that we just move J out of the way uh, because it's not downloaded all the more, uh, anymore. And we remove J from the child of I. That's uh, quite an implementation detail, but I need a way to know when to backtrack. So right now we have only C logic to go down. So that means that when we have a head somewhere, we always got to try to go deeper in that part of the graph. So the theory is that everyone's going to try to go deeper in their own part of the, of the DAG. And so they leave lots of open places for uh, other nodes to start downloading. And the way I, I do this is by removing nodes. So here, X just downloaded K, it downloaded L. And so now that it downloaded L, uh, I only have one children, which we're about to remove. And because I have no children, we also remove it from the root. And so basically, when something, when a part of the DAG is done, when we fully downloaded it, we just remove it. It's not longer part of the tree. And so people, it won't be considered anymore. Um, does anyone have a question? Because this is really everything I implemented and it, it's just algorithm. So if people have questions, it's a good moment. I have a really basic question that I missed off the top, Tropo, if you don't mind. X, yeah. Y, and Z are parallel workers in the same node? Yeah, sorry. So good, good question. So uh, X, Y, and Z, all of this runs in one node. So you run one node and it's, you can imagine it's three different gateways. So I'm downloading from ipfs.io, from section.pl, and from my gateway. Gotcha. So three sources. Yeah. And and on the and, but what you're visualizing here is the client side, sort of workers that are doing the fetching. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it might be that I implemented it like that, so in my head it makes sense. But the way totally. to, each gateway have a go routine, and so each gateway is a worker that traverses the graph independently. Right. Um, and so, and and but what you're also saying is there is a one-to-one -one correlation between the provider count and the worker count. So if you had four providers, you could theoretically have four. Uh, workers. So no, in my example, I had I put three per three worker per provider because uh, it optimized a lot the latency. Uh, right. But it's just working around kind of maybe. Uh, I will talk about that right after this. Does anyone have a question about the algorithm? before I, I move on. Hannah has one. Yeah, okay. quick question. Are these, are these are individual block downloads? Yeah, each node is- Yeah, and so when you go through the gateway, you're using like raw format or something? No, I go with the gateway with uh, car format. Oh, sorry, uh, I get a car. So that's a, a stream of block. And for each block, I iterate over all the block in the car. And I, I, I do the algorithm. So that's the difference between the strong line and the dotted line. The strong line is a place where I started doing my HTTP request. And the dotted line is the line that I got, I, I expect to get within that stream of blocks. So when uh -huh. you're getting more and more blocks from inside the car file, I don't move the head. The head stays where the gateway was started, the request was started. But you would cancel the request like halfway through if you decided you didn't want any more exactly. than blo blocks. Okay, cool. Yeah, if I don't like the blocks I'm getting, then I just close the request. Got it. So I guess no more question. Uh, no, quick, no more <clears throat> interesting point. How do we add more protocols? Uh, the first one is graphing, which I'm thinking about. Uh, it's very useful because graphing is a lot like very fancy car file over gateway. You start a request somewhere and it gives you uh, more blocks. It, it gives you block, like the server is pushing more and more blocks to you. So I already have all the logic to this. 
the thing that would be needed is to implement that interface, um, which take the context because that's good. You want to cancel the request. Uh, the starting CID for that request. And this thing, which I call a traversal, a traversal, which it's just an internal representation of a request. Uh, has It's basically like an IPLD selector, except it, it does less stuff. So you could translate traversal uh, objects to selectors. And even if you didn't want it, you, you could uh, assume that um, the current gateway protocol, for example, I don't even look at the traversal. I just, if I get blocks that are not in my traversal, I, I, I close the connection. So I fall back to bit swap like uh, protocol where I do one request per block if the if that's not happening. So you could do the same thing on graphs. You just always send the selectors that say, give me everything. And if I don't like what you're sending me, I kill the connection. Um, so that would be, graph sync would be fairly easy to integrate. Uh, you need to implement that interface basically where I started, I can start a download and then I have a function to give me more blocks. Um, the more complicated part is gonna be BitSwap because BitSwap needs to uh, remember where the direction of the, so sorry, with, with uh, on the right, we can see Z, which is a, a server-driven uh, protocol. So I start a request and from that request, I'm gonna get all the blocks and running. BitSwap doesn't do this. BitSwap is one-to-one. -one. I ask you one block, you give me one block back. So we need to be more active with the head and to move it more often. However, we don't want to request only one block. So we need a way to represent a range of block while still maintaining the property of the metric. So the metric, we need to count how many blocks we have in that metric, um, uh, how many heads, like how many downloaders are underneath. Um, so the way I think I'm thinking to do this is with a snake of work. So X is a is a client driven protocol where I request blocks one to one. And so for each block that I added to the request, I'm creating a linked list of them. That means that now we have not only a head for the worker, but the worker also have a tail, which is A. So when you when I download block, I uh, either cut them if I if for example if at this point I got L, I would just say K now go to I because I got L. So either I cut I cut off part of the linked list to make it shorter, and if I got A, I can replace the order of the I can go down the list of work to add or subtract uh, elements from the metric. So if I got A for example, I would remove one to A because X will no longer be interested and we won't do I because it's, we have blocks underneath. So any question? Uh, I'm mostly done. I was thinking of presenting a more detailed, the trade-off of what cutting off the connection does. So I'm gonna look at more code for this. Uh, this is the current test code I have. So it started a download request and it just uh, iterate over all the blocks. Uh, that's a channel. Here, okay. Sorry, there. Just it will be bigger. Okay. So right now I'm starting with uh, three different. No, sorry. I have four gateway, and each gateway has three runner. So that's twelve. Uh, so I run twelve worker in parallel. And the reason I do this is that every time I cut off the gateway, there is for at least the round trip time, the remote peer doesn't know I've cut the connection. Because like my packets cannot go there faster than the speed of light. So when I cut, cut off the connection, all the like at least one round trip of data is still in the pipes, like in the internet pipes, in the buffer of different routers, in fibers. And so this takes a while to get to me. And this is wasted data. So what I want to do is when I cut off one connection, I want that amount of data to be lower. So I have more connection. So now each connection, like if we can imagine I have one gigabit per second. And I have one second of latency to appear. We can do the bandwidth delay, uh, delay product, which is going to tell me that I have one gigabit of data uh, stored in the pipe uh, at any moment. And so what I'm going to do is, because now I have 12 and not one, the 12 gigabit is going to be divided. Uh, 12 gigabit per second is going to be divided by 12, assuming every every node get a, a, a balance share of the network. And so now, when I get one connection. I waste uh, uh, 12 of a, gigab uh, of a gigabit. I don't well, I don't waste the complete thing. Uh, so this helps a lot to have more workers, but it, it, it has a decremental point. Like at some point you can add more and more workers, they don't go faster. So that helps going faster. Uh, 
And yeah, uh, I just stuck to the few gateways. Uh, the last interesting thing is I've discovered, uh, I have decided to look at the CPU usage of my client and it's extremely good. So at first I was testing with uh, the default client from Go. Uh, I just need to brought up the profiler. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a result of profiler downloading at uh, roughly 200 megabyte, mega, no, 200 megabyte per second, which is uh, roughly 2.5 gigabit. And we can see that none, absolutely none of the, no, we have 12 samples within my code. Uh, all the code, which I actually find quite funny, is in the HTTP library, uh, all the CPU usage. So uh, I was using HTTP2 because it's the default that Go does. Uh, if it can, it will use HTTP2. And like 30% of the of the CPU time is spent doing syscalls. We also have a few lot elsewhere in the HTTP library. Uh, so that was interesting. And so I actually decided to change it to HTTP1 uh, because HTTP1 is a simpler protocol. It goes faster with HTTP1 because HTTP1, because I have free stream to the same peers, HTTP1 does have head of lines issue. So if I have three, three, three streams to the same peer, each peer gets its own TCP connection, while with HTTP2, each stream gets uh, or shared on one, one TCP connection. Uh, that means that we have head of lines issue. It's when you cannot read the stream A because you lost data from stream B. So HTTP1 is faster and it also uses less CPU, but it's still, uh, we're still heavily, heavily dominated by the hashing speed, uh, but not hashing, the HTTP usage. So we can see 40% uh, of time was spent doing HTTP and 20% was spent uh, doing hashing. So I'm, I'm quite happy because I didn't try to optimize the code and it's still miles ahead from GoBitSwap. If you do the same thing with GoBitSwap, you see GoBitSwap in the profile. You don't see it a lot, you see mostly quick, but uh, yeah, so that was interesting to discover the details of like, it's surprising. It's surprisingly costly to do uh, a few uh, like gigabit per second speed, multi gigabit per second speed on on each. So I'm done. Audible claps. Thank you, Jerova. Oh uh, um, no, I need to add one thing. If you want to look at the code, I'll just send the link. Perfect. And we'll drop that in the meeting notes. I'm trying to say it aloud. Does anyone have any questions? Open the floor up. I have a very quick one. Like, uh, if you could add something to the car export, what would be the most oh, useful? No, uh, very good oh, question. So, I mostly care about downloading Unix FS data right now, and the trick of uh, killing the connection, you still waste a round trip every time you do that. So, I would add, um, I would add a way to uh, pass through the gateway. So when I start downloading, for example, if I'm only interested in a few direct uh, in a file within the directory, I can give the pass to the car export, and the remote gateway will walk the pass for me. So I don't have to kill the connection because it's going in a place I don't want. I can tell it where I want to go, uh, at least for Unix FS data. Uh, the API I have with uh, IPSL, I can describe in theory like very fairly complex request, and I, I don't actually think we need that right now. I would mostly use just uh, Unix FS. Yeah, this seems to be kind of like carving around the, the querying problem that seems to show up in a lot of other protocols by just saying there is no querying. The client receives everything and we do. And, and I think what's really interesting about the repeat approach in contrast to some of the others is your, your approach is much more client heavy. Um, I mean, it's, I can show that it's not actually heavy. It's heavy in like not, complexity of the client, right. but it's surprisingly cheap. But I, um, what, by client heavy, what I mean is uh, we are reliant on having providers of content that are willing to just ad hoc, like it, that are trusting the client to not request multiple blocks. Um, yeah, for example. Right? Actually, like, because I've you have to proactively cut off this. So that's yeah, the like, part. Because, uh, like, yeah, one, one interesting I could thing. get greedy and just not cut those connections off and leave that, like, like oh, no, thing. you still don't want that because uh, you will waste your own bandwidth. Like most of, of the time you're limited by the receive bandwidth. So right. one interesting thing though, uh, which is particularly about gateway, but most gateway 
make them make themselves faster by caching responses. So if a uh, first person downloads a calf file, usually it's a second one when you download the same calf file, it's gonna is not gonna hit the IPFS node, it's gonna hit some Nginx or whatever server they have. The issue with Rapid is that it randomly walks the graph and it selects random node and it depends on what happened. So actually Rapid re requests, like most of the blocks are the same. It's just the calf file will be different. So you really need a load. If you want to efficiently cache Rapid requests, you need a load balancer that knows uh, IPLD data and is able to understand like what a car request is and how can I extract some blocks from the car, so. Go ahead, Matthew. Hey, uh, I think I missed this before, but um, what's the benefit of using cars over raw in this context? Uh, you save a round trip on each connection. So like most of the time you start downloading a block and there is like thousands of other candidates. So the connection doesn't get canceled. Like it's it's fairly rare. It happened a few times. Uh, it's usually uh, every second that you, you kill one connection and I get to a thousand of blocks per second with my speed. So you, you for, for the default case where everything's happening fine, you don't have to send a request every time. Oh, okay. So you can download multiple blocks. Yeah. Okay. If I implement the client driven, when I will do bit swap, you could do, you could take the bit swap manager code that like will do the work like bit swap doing multiple requests in parallel and do a, a request per block in parallel to the gateway using raw instead of car. That would work, but I think it would still not be worth it. Just like, not, no, it will be worth it, but you will have to do like so many HTTP requests we get uh, less efficient back there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a very, um, I think the way, like the amount of work that you put into, uh, yeah, I guess the big thing I wanted to talk about was like, when you got into the Unix FS versus sort of like IPLD distinction, one of the things we've noticed about Unix FS data is it tends to be very bottom heavy, right? The leaves are where the actual data lives and the uh, content connecting those leaves, the sort of internal branches are all just linking information, connecting you up to a root CID, right? And so part of what I'm wondering and what would be really interesting in, uh, in addition to Lytle's question about seeing how quick slash HTTP3 would compare when thrown into the mix is this question of like, could you, is there an optimization to be had by proactively having one of your workers do everything it can to sort of map the fast, small branches and then distribute at the leap side? So if it, it has matters, that okay, that good question. It matters only if you have very, it matters if you have so little work that you forced it to do duplicated work. Like you cannot find not duplicated work, which only happens in like the first few uh, millisecond, like the 100 millisecond of the, of the request to still know very little about the DAG, then it's useful. After that, it's not really useful because you just, like uh, Unix FS is so wide, it's so bottom heavy that it's very unlikely that happened. Like it very quickly stopped happening. So one way I was thinking is we could use something like GraphSync to download all the blocks to let's say a depth of two. And that should give us enough logs that this stop happening. But this will only really speed up the few, so it's a really starting, like the start of the request. Most of the request just not happening. And one thing also, uh, it's quite interesting to think about when I was reviewing the reviewing, when other people made their presentation about which protocol is more uh, server uh, driven, where more which one is more client driven. And it's, I think most protocol fell in that. Uh, there are a few hybrids one where you can, like the protocol is responsible, like the different node will use whatever to agree on who send the block to what. But that is still, you can usually make those client driven by lying. For example, if you have the tit for tat algorithm in BitTorrent, it's kind of the same thing, where the node tries to download and people have blocks first. Um, but I, most protocols still fall within clients on server, I think. Uh, yeah, but I think what's interesting here is you, you do have a, your client server relationship assumes multiple servers. Like it, it's naturally, you're naturally already dealing with multiple providers and optimizing for that, right? Which not that, all of 
you can run it yeah. on one if you want. It's just going to exactly. But I mean, I think the your approach of special casing, or not special, it's just like having the common case of a single provider. Just is what it is. Cool, but like I, it's it, meant for peer to peer. So in in peer to peer, yeah. you usually usually have more than one. Right, and and it seems like your the primary focus of Repeat is to do the discovery DAG discovery process and fast and have that be part of the protocol and not require like a lot of the other approaches we've seen in others almost all of them not all of them many of them involve some type of metadata superstructure or construction before the transfer even happens uh yeah. to actually one, yeah, it's included in flight. it's still you could uh take the data and also protocol make and use it within happy to more efficiently use like at the start if i have ten thousand nodes i know i can download from okay maybe not that much maybe a hundred and I just know the root CID. The only solution I have is to send to, to request the root CID from everyone or some part of them. If you at this point, if you were able to use another protocol to augment the information, Rapid would be able to optimistically start downloading from other peers. So mm -hmm. it will still be useful to have a, a manifest or different right. things like that. It's just not critical. If you don't have it, it's just like the start you case. Build it on the fly. Again. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. It, uh, yeah, it, it really does make you wonder about the structure of the DAGs, as you said, like when, when they're wide, uh, Rapid actually seems to develop. If you have lots of providers and wide graphs, Rapid good. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So even if it's not very wide, it's still pretty good. It's basically a question of the ratio. It's like you want right. a DAG that's wider than the number of providers you have. Yeah. If you have like, like a DAG that's too wide, but you have two providers, it's fine. Yeah, but like a blockchain is not chain. For a blockchain, it will just be as fast as like the fastest protocol you have. So for example, yeah. graphing from one peer. Or for the blockchain, you need to do what Lotus does, which is quite fun, is it requests a manifest from someone which gives them a hundred blocks. And they optimistically download the hundred blocks in parallel from Bitswa. You could do the same thing with Rapid. It will not, it will not be as good as the white case. The white case right. is like the bar, it's a better, it's the best. Because you just do Rapid like recursively. You do smaller and smaller Rapid. Right. It seems to me that the way that you're doing this fast, you're the simultaneous construction of the hash or of the manifest or like whatever, and while it's being downloaded, it just looks a, a lot like reference counting to me. Like, is that fair? Like yeah. where you, where, yeah, you're just building reference counting based on fetch. That's the metric I want. So right now it is because I didn't have any idea of how to make a good metric. So I just say X many downloader, so that's a metric. Right. Ideally you want a matrix that's quite smart because if you have um, a, a part of the DAG, like you have two choice in the DAG and one of them is very small and one of them is very fast. You want more people going to the very fast case However, right now, Rapid will distribute them equally. It's not really useful. So what happens is that the fast case, the, uh, lots of people, too much, will go on the very small part of the DAG. It will get downloaded quickly, but we also have lots of cancels, lot of yeah, lot of race, which is wasteful. So that's bad for efficiency. And then everyone will backtrack, and everyone will go back to the big case. Uh, I mean, the half that go back to the small one. So ideally, the metric should be more a, ra a ratio of like how, do, how big do we expect that part of the DAG to be? Uh, how, how fast are the nodes also? Because right now it assumes that two nodes, two providers are equal, whatever. Not However, sure. if yeah. I have a provider that's much faster, it's actually worth more. So you should have like, you could, you should put higher in the metric. Could increment more. So you could basically wait by latency. On... Uh, not latency, to Sorry. I, I'm round optimizing trip, for a shorter round trip times. Right. No, I'm optimizing for trooper. Right. Pick your metric. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you Sorry. could optimize right. on latency also. Right. Yeah, but like, uh, you. You say, okay, we want throughput, the higher throughput here is going to be able to assign greater weights to the graph. Yeah. In the, reference so the issue is like, because the throughput varies, either you need to update all the throughput, to, like all the weights you have gone previously. What's very good about having very dumb one is that when I go down the DAG, I add plus one. When I go up, I remove one. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, easy to code. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can see how that could create a lot of problems when, if if you just change it to, a constant factor of the worker weight, then it's great. I'm add to, remove to, cool. But if that's fluctuating based on throughput, then your reference counting is going to get all yeah. wackadoodle. 
or you need to like set measure the throughput at the start, for example, and then never change it, mm -hmm. or reactualize it when you restart the download. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think like if you take like the crack and sync approach, it would compose really well with what you have if you ended up with a bit field of blocks instead. I, I could see how you could how you could actually wait. It would work. The bits. No, yeah, no, it would work. The main point of the main issue I have right now, I've not implemented. Uh, I call it "Don't go there." But the point is that not everyone has everything, and right now I assume that all the peers all, uh, have all the files. And so the build field might be useful for uh, for that. However, the issue I see with the bit field is that you don't know the bit field without first asking it from someone or like traversing the data. Well, Happy doesn't need a, it's, I could make it faster if, if you had some traversal, but in theory, you don't need it. You can just like everything is building the DAG while it's downloading. So I think that could save some pre-computation time on the, like, again, you, you see the thing, Happy doesn't need any information beforehand. You just know need the root CID and it does its stuff. I don't. Uh, yeah, so I, I have like a qu follow up question to um, rapidly being kind of like blind to the to the content just cares about being able to traverse things. So I have a like question, are you leveraging the uh, codec inside of a CID for any optimization? Uh, I've not done that yet. So actually, there are better optimization to do if you're just dealing with Unix FS, because with Unix mm -hmm. FS and DACPB actually, we have a T size field, which is an approximation of the size of the DAG and the, the blo and second block. So we could use a T size with the Unix FS to steer faster peers to our bigger peers of the bigger, bigger parts of the key space. Like a slow peer, we download a small file, and a fast peer will download a fast file, a fast file, a big file, sorry. I've not done that yet. It's just, I mean, it's already quite fast for something that's not optimized. So I'm very happy with that. And there is a certain simplicity of having some, like I like the simplicity of not having a bunch of edge cases, like the Unix FS edge case where I know the size, the the codec where I know it's a raw block, so I know I won't have a block behind it. Yeah, exactly. Hello. Yeah, I just want to say one thing I really like about this is that that the um the focus on the client, uh, specifically because like if we have agreed that we are not going to have an Uber protocol, then we implicitly agree we have clients that understand multiple protocols. Um, so I think that that actually means that the client becomes a, an important piece of software. Um, and maybe to some extent, maybe it's like, you know, as long as the client is for one particular application, it can be simple. But like in a lot of cases, you're going to want a more complex client that speaks multiple protocols. So. Yeah, and I will. I did the 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 algorithm is really interesting. I'm I'm still trying to grok. I, I mean, I grok mostly, but I just want to want to make sure I really kind of play around with the code. I think. Yeah, if you look at the code, it's a bit ugly. I mean, the algorithm I reason it to be a uh, very concurrent. So what's nice is that uh, rapid on my CPU right now it uses about two core to download at two gigabit per second. Uh, however, because it's extremely concurrent, like it's very well spread out around my 12 threads on the CPU. So it doesn't look like it's using lots of resources because it just used like 10% of each core. Uh, if you, so the way I did the code to do that is that it's, it's multi-threaded using locks, but the locks are on each node and it's eventually consistent. So sometimes you have like a wrong behavior where some find uh, some worker will try to go down the wrong part of the DAG because uh, the data have not been updated yet. However, if you dot that, it should realize it's a wrong part, wrong wrong part of the DAG later. So, for example, you try to go down. The, uh, someone just downloaded, finished a part of the DAG. We have a branch of the tree that's finished. We have a worker that's going to go up the tree one by one and remove all the nodes from the tree. So then everyone will be pushed up. Uh, it's like the thing where because I remove all, all of the children then the default case of like backtracking will, will happen. Uh, and for example, in that case, say there can be a race where like, I start removing the nodes one by one, but you're still seeing a node which I have not removed. So you go down and then later you're going to keep doing down. And after down, you realize, oh, there is no more stuff. So I'm going to backtrack. Uh, if you're looking at the code, I think it's the main thing to be aware of is that the code is weird because it does that. 
Except in this, I think if you know how the rough explanation of the algorithm and you know that, I think you can understand the code. It's pretty, it's not that bad. Wow. Yeah, I, I kind of like the wrapping up thought here is that it, um, this shifting of kind of like com complexity or like responsibility to the client is actually, I think, a feature. And maybe uh, j just like a uh, food for thought is that we wanted, we want people to verify data they retrie retrieve from IPFS. That's the entire point. But it, no one had any incentive to do that. Now we have a very, you know, we we understand why it's important. Many people don't care because it's like slower or whatever. Like rapid is actually like providing the incentive. One, it's truly faster. Uh, and second thing, by the sheer fact that it's like on the client, uh, like I agree with like it's very nice to have this like generic base. But then the clients who are mostly care like mostly care about Unix FS, um, then can have like additional optimizations. Uh, on top of the generic one. And I think that's a really nice uh, layering happening on the client. And I feel that kind of like maybe like this, the speed is the killer feature that we wanted uh, yes. to incentivize I, people to verify. It's a thing I was verify. jealous. And jealous is not the right word. I was admiring the fact that BitTorrent, if you want to share a file with lots of people, it's the fastest technology. It's probably, BitTorrent is still probably still faster. But we have, before, IPFS was slower than HTTP. Now, if you use Rapid, you're, you're faster to use Rapid with multiple peers than, uh, than just HTTP from one server. So I, it's a point you were making. But it's a, a thing I love about HTTP is that you can get higher throughput because you do multi-peer download and stuff. And so we didn't have it on IPFS, and now we have it. So I'm, I'm happy. Uh, Ahana, I see you asked, what's IPSL? Uh, so. I wanted a way to describe request in Rapid because I, I'll just share my screen so I can uh, show parts of the code. The, uh, where is IPS? I was right here. So in Rapid, uh, I have this IPSL traversal, and that's also what I accept in my thing. So the current IP I would have, uh, which actually I can find because it should be right here, good block. Exactly. This one. I, I ask you for a CID of a list of, or a list of CID, and uh, the client uh, is going to give me back the old block. So that's the API of the old client. With Rapid, I need to view the DAG because the whole point of Rapid is I do ref counting of the metric, and so I can go left and right, and I can smartly uh, divide the DAG into smaller and smaller DAG where I keep applying the same algorithm. So I need to know the DAG. Uh, the best way I think to do that is you have an object, some object, is that is able to, you give it the block and it tells you what was the next block to do that. Uh, you might know that as selectors from IPLB, they have the same feature. Um, however, selectors are actually slightly different. They're not built directly for that use case and it's surprisingly hard to get them to give you a relationship between the blocks. Um, the, so I've created IPSL, which does the same job as selector mostly where I have a single object and I can, progressively traverse it to get the, to, to get to know the DAG as I download it. However, IPSL has a fairly small API compared to selectors. Uh, it takes blocks uh, block dot block, which is just a, a CID and some bytes. So those two one do nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just a log detail. But so it, it has this API, which is a block and CID, where selectors work on the IPLD data model, which more complicated, more stuff. And this, this is mainly useful because it's, it's uh, smaller to implement. So if I go to the Unix FS implementation, right now, it's, quite, it, it's kind of fun because I, I made this thing to like describe graphs. And for example, with IPSL, you can say, uh, I want first you to go in folder A's and folder B's and folder C. And in folder C, you download some range within a file. The only thing I have implemented for now is download everything because this was easy to do. So, it's it's like it's API I, I would like of I have a block uh, so that the uh, Unix FS implementation of the IPSL mm, everything uh, no and so it it just 
uh, parse the block. Uh, if that's a raw, uh, raw block, CID raw, I, nothing. CID raw have no children in, in Unix FS. Uh, then I parse the protobuf. There is two protobuf within each other because of uh, Unix FS and reasons. And I build the list. So I take the links. I take the, I make a result slice, which is just another traversal and the, and the CID. So the CID is just a list of all CIDs and the traversal for everything. Everything is a recursive node that applies itself forever. So it's just uh, uh, itself, uh, N, which is that. I've also made it so that everything I'm using it for now. It, it doesn't, it's just useful to talk to Rapid, the, like the Rapid code inside yourself. So let's say the gateway code inside Kubo can talk to the Rapid code and the gateway code can give it a useful information. That's the thing I'm using for it now. Uh, I got a bit carried away. So I also implemented the programming language to describe the Rapid queries. But we don't actually use that right now. And we don't have any need for it right now because uh, for the gateway, I'm mostly interested in like having a, instead of having Rappi describing the, the reach request on gateway where I go to a folder and stuff, uh, um, having IPSL to describe those gateway, those requests, I'll just probably, we, will, we probably will like add rules to the gateway saying, oh, that's Unix FS and that's how Unix FS work. Um, so, the, so right now it has a programming language, which you can use, you don't have to use it. I'm not using it. Um, uh, it's list-like, uh, so it's sort of a test case. That's an, that's an example code. So that's uh, the, the outer one, this creates a node, which is a, a thing, a part in the tree. Reflect is the name of the node. Uh, reflect is a testing node that just outputs the same thing. It returns the same value you passed in. Uh, that's a comment, so that's a comment. And another node, and that's a CID literal. So it parses that as a CID. And so you can in theory construct, uh, for example, if I go to Unix FS test, this one, uh, I can take this, uh, which is just going to be a name. And so this creates a, a Unix FS scope, load a scope. A scope is a list of optional features. So you have lots of the theories that that are different. We have lots of data format, not everyone wants to implement them. So either those are built in, or you can use Wasm to load more, more data format that are supported. And so this is loading the Unix FS scope, which is uh, right here. That's the name of the Unix FS scope. And this creates, so this is a query that basically download everything within uh, some Unix FS thing. Uh, this load the Unix FS scope, and then it called Unix FS of everything, which return use the traversal object I was showing earlier. That is right here. Uh, it, it returns you one of those objects that, again, recursively will just give you all the blocks or some Unix FS. And, but again, the plan is not to merge. Uh, what I'm go probably going to do is take IPSL, take the useful part out of it, which is just the internal representation and the interfaces, and the compiler and the language design and using it on top of other protocol. And we don't need to, I don't have, I have no use case for this right now. And probably we are, gonna we are not going to use it for now. Uh, at least that, so yeah. Is that clear enough or does that answer the question? Yes, that's certainly a start. <laughs> okay. So, I, because I know lots of people are passionate about uh, graph description language. So I will take the language part out of it and we'll just use the, the thing that's useful for now. Uh, That's awesome. Um, I love the idea of like, here's a demo, here's a, a protocol. I wrote a programming language and threw it away and did not find it reasonable to address in anything other than a final comment on a closing question. <laughs> Drupal, you take the cake for some effort. <laughs> yeah, it but, was actually surprisingly fine. List, the point of list is that it's very easy to parse and compile. And even though my code does not execute less list, it's not list, it's still very easy to parse and compile. So uh, whoever designed list did it very, very well. Yeah, it's, it, it's not so fun to read being full. Yeah, real, but... I agree. I realized that after. Like... <laughs> Don't tell the list fans. Yeah. Uh, but the good part is the compiler is only uh, 400 lines. Rapid is more lines of code than the compiler to use, to use it, so. It's a good sign. Very cool. Does anybody have any last questions before we wrap up? No? 
this is really interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where you take this next. Uh, do you have further plans for this, Jerobo? Yeah, so uh, I want to include that in Kubo eventually. For that, uh, I have actually a master plan issue that describes it. But the goal is to have it in Kubo, so I can go bit swap, have issues. Uh, uh, yeah. So is is the plan to keep HTTP as the primary data transport? Oh uh, no, I just implemented that because I was a bit on a uh, I was on the time crunch, and this was totally. the easiest thing to implement. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sending that right now. Uh, yeah. So we can. I mean, I don't have any particular interest of like what protocol goes into it. Ideally, we add as many protocols as possible, so everything works. Uh, right. Practice is going to. We'll see. So. Cool. Thank you so much for taking the time to present, Jeroko. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everybody for coming today to ask cogent questions and help help poke holes and understand better. Uh, to everybody else, uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Uh, I think we have a presenter prepared, but I'm going to circle back and make sure they're all ready to roll. But yeah, if you would like to present at Movement Bytes Working Group, any of your work, come forth, send a message in the Filecoin Slack. Move the Bytes Working Group channel. It can be tangential to moving bytes. It should be data transport related, but we'd love to see your work. Cool. With that, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>